thank you everyone um, for having me on this uh, this webinar. And I'd like to thank the International Society of Cardio Oncology. Um, my name is Pooja Ketcher. I'm one of the assistant professors in cardiac surgery at Washington University School of Medicine here in St. Louis. Um, and I was really asked to talk about the surgical management of um, both coronary artery disease and valve dysfunction in, um, in oncology patients and really the role of the CT surgeon. Um, so um, I don't have any disclosures for my talk. Um, and feel free anytime to you know, stop and ask questions. This was more meant to be interactive. Um, but really what I wanted to talk about, and you know, I'm talking to a group of cardiologists and um, people involved in oncology, um, you're well aware of um, some of the relations of coronary artery disease in the cancer patient, um, but I just kind of want to review over that and how that becomes important um, in seeing patients and kind of dealing with them. And then mainly I'll review about four cases um, that have some complex decision making and how a cardiac surgeon um, becomes involved in the process because there's really no one size fits all strategy. And I'll talk about some of the minimally invasive surgical strategies that we use and some of the data associated with them. Now, that's not specific to the oncology population, but um, it is relevant in seeing if it can be done successfully, how it does pan out for, um, for all patients. Um, so the background, you know, is as there's an improvement in cancer, prog cancer prognosis for both um, solid and hematological cancers, um, this now, as you know, has become kind of a chronic disease. And so there's an increased incidence of um, uh, both myocardial infarction, uh, acute coronary syndrome, and coronary artery disease in this cancer population. And obviously, those who are already at higher risk um, become even higher risk and have um, higher incidence of these di dis disorders. And so in order to maintain the survival trend in cancers, um, it's important to identify and manage coronary artery disease in this population. So as you all know that um, uh, inflammation and oxidative stress are some of the underlying factors in the common pathogenesis. And that's why there's common risk factors between both cancers and coronary artery disease. And so some of the ones listed, as we all know, high blood pressure and diabetes, um, cholesterol, smoking, inactivity, and unhealthy diet are not only related to those development uh, of uh, you know, both cancers, but also in coronary disease. And similarly, you, know, you also have the patients who receive anti-cancer therapies and have cardiotoxicity. And so, um, as you're well aware on the left-hand side that these, these agents really lead to vascular injuries. And, and uh, so there's direct vascular injury to, to the patients, but also can lead to rest ischemia as well as myocardial ischemia. And platinum drugs, as you know, are um, increase the incidence and long-term risk of coronary artery disease. Um, particularly where it becomes important is also radiotherapy, um, which leads to fibrosis of all vessel walls and can lead to accelerated atherosclerosis. Um, and, and the incidence of coronary disease in this population is actually linear to the amount of the radiotherapy received. So there's some quota statistic about 7% for every gray. Um, and then other drug therapies such as VEGF inhibitors that increase the risk of uh, acute coronary syndrome in patients who receive, receive them. So there's a number of ways that um, both with radiotherapy, chemotherapy regimens, and then the general risks that all interplay in um, leading to uh, you know, coronary disease and valve disease in these cancer patients. Um, so here, I'm gonna talk, let's break it up into cases, we'll go through two uh, mostly related to coronary disease and two related to valve disease. Um, so the first case is of a 59-year-old Caucasian gentleman. He had a history of a nasopharyngeal Hodgkin's lymphoma um, that was treated with radiotherapy to both the nasopharyngeal area as well as the bilateral necks about 18 years prior in a different state. So we didn't have a lot of the records. Um, and he presented uh, with laryngeal cancer to the ENT surgeon, um, and he had hoarseness and odynophagia. Um, his only other were hypertension and tobacco abuse, which he was a current smoker, actually, and was really only receiving um, 
uh, blood pressure medication. And his family history, he did have a brother who was, um, was diagnosed with coronary artery disease at the same age, but didn't have any interventions. Um, so he went to the ENT surgeon and uh, the surgeon recommended a partial uh, versus total laryngectomy, depending on the margins and kind of it's how extensive this uh, resection would be. It seemed like a fairly aggressive tumor because his his symptoms had progressed significantly over the last month or two prior to his presentation. So he went to the operating room um, and during the laryngectomy after induction, he had an intraoperative ST elevations, mainly in V5 leads and some brief runs of ventricular tachycardia. So at that time, because it was an aggressive tumor and airway compromise was a concern, um, he underwent a tracheostomy and then they kind of aborted the procedure and they called cardiology. And, um, you know, given his risk factors, tobacco history, same hypertension, all the things that we talked about, he underwent a left heart cath and uh, an echocardiogram. And so, and the left heart cath, they only just showed one film. You can see that there's a proximal LAD uh, stenosis. All other vessels were pretty good. And um, he luckily had normal LV function. So now you have a patient, you know, we went back to the, um, and, and the plan at that time was not to perform any intervention because the ENT surgeon was pretty uh, adamant that he felt that this tumor was aggressive. So if the patient um, was gonna have an aggressive tumor, he wanted to make sure that he could still operate and didn't want this patient to get plavix. And so he repeated the CT scan and then there was an interval increase in the size of this tumor um, and the patient was having actually more symptoms uh, since he had seen him in the office the month prior. And so the surgeon felt that any delay in laryngectomy more than a month may make the tumor unresectable. Um, so there's options, you know, there's still percutaneous options available. Um, and so the thoughts were either um, the interventional cardiologist was, would perform some sort of laser atherectomy or an angioplasty. Um, versus, you know, traditional cabbage. And so, um, and then thinking about the various approaches, how do we get this guy recovered from a surgical approach in order to get his real cancer therapy? And so um, we were able to perform a minimally invasive cabbage and I'll kind of go over exactly what we did, but uh, to give you a course of the timeline, he got his cabbage Three days later, he underwent a total laryngectomy and day five after his total laryngectomy, he stayed longer for that than the cabbage. He was home and, um, and he's still alive today. Um, so really talking a little bit about minimally invasive uh, coronary bypass, and this is different than what's called mixed cabbage, which is all revascularization of all territories of the heart. But here we were able to just do um, we feel better outcomes with mid cab So this is just really addresses LAD, single vessel disease, either the LAD or the diagonal. Uh, and it's done by a left anterior thoracotomy. It's really a couple inches incision. The entire uh, lima harvest is taken down through this sort of dome-like retractor and you have uh, performed this anastomosis on a beating heart. Um, you have the option of doing cardiopulmonary bypass depending on if the patient can tolerate the um, the uh, exposure of the LAD, because sometimes you have to twist the heart forward and people drop their um, filling of the heart and can't tolerate it, especially patients with diminished EF. So, um, but you know, you still get the advantage of uh, the survival benefit of a Lima graft. So that's really what's important in this. So this is kind of the setup of how it is. Uh, the patient's lying supine on the table. Um, there's an incision. This is only about six, six centimeters at most that you really need. There's a dome-like retractor that's initially placed, kind of like makes the chest um, into this dome where you can do the direct takedown of the lima artery. And that's probably one of the most challenging parts of this case. And then there's two additional ports placed to, um, to allow for retraction of the heart and placement. And then the options of doing on-pump beating heart surgery, you still do have to give heparin, so it's to be mindful of that, not to the same levels of that required for um, cardiopulmonary bypass and um, on-pump surgery. But if you're off-pump, you still have to require heparin at, at the doses of like transcatheter procedures where there's an ACT level greater than three to 350. Um, so 
the the artery can either be bypassed with a, a coronary shunt to so allow perfusion during the case, and it depends for cases. If you come in with a blocked, completely blocked um, LAD, then they can tolerate just opening up the vessel. Sometimes you have to do a proximal occlusion. Sometimes you have to let you know, occlude both sides. If they tolerate, you can do a test occlusion. So it just kind of depends on the hemodynamics of the patient in the operating room. So this guy had a pretty large LAD. Uh, we used an intravascular shunt. Um, and then here you just perform a direct anastomosis after stabilizing the heart. And that's kind of how it worked out well for him. So minimally invasive cabbage is, um, there's many advantages to it. There's often less blood loss with this. You're not dissecting everything. You give less heparin dose, so you don't have a lot of the bleeding complications. It's less than, we quote, patients for traditional cabbage, one in 10 patients will go back to the operating room for bleeding. Here, obviously, you avoid the sternal wound complications, um, can have a shorter length of stay, and that's more related to the off-pump, but also the recovery for a patient. I say potentially less painful here, but especially men with large pectoralis muscles can have a lot of uh, pain from just dividing them and they're more sore than a sternotomy. So that's variable per patient, I would say. Um, some of the disadvantages, um, it's technically challenging. It's really, I think uh, at our center, there's really one person who does it. Um, and so not it's, it's not widely used because the, the learning curve is a, is a bit challenging. Uh, this is actually my first case at our institution and the guy skin to skin was done under two hours. And so I was uh, sort of uh, spoiled on my first case uh, that it went so well, um, but it's not for every patient. And I'll talk a little bit about the patency rates and how they may vary. Um, so so really Pooja, that's a great case. The uh, couple of questions, you know, you're, uh, not that long ago, I'd say probably five to eight years ago, there was, I know there was uh, at least a trial, and I think it was a, initially sponsored by the NIH or maybe some sort of partial NIH sponsorship of hybrid revascularization where, you know, maybe you do off-pump surgery uh, for the Lima and then potentially percutaneous treatment of some other lesion if that was necessary. So what whatever happened from from that trial or I, I don't recall what you trial. know what went on. Case. <laughs> My second case was going to be a hybrid case and I'll, we'll go over some of the data. People do use it. The the main thing and, and that was the point of this was that um, you know there's this uh, there's this approach that we can use for single vessel disease. There's going to be an approach, and I'll show you the next case, which is a hybrid case. Um, it really requires a heart team approach, and I think that's one of the things that I want everyone to really be aware of. In the transcatheter world, we have a great heart team approach. You know, I run a clinic with an interventional cardiologist, um, and then we sit as six surgeons, I mean, sorry, three surgeons, three cardiologists. And we talk about each and every case and really we, in coronary intervention we almost don't do that and so i think it's not so much that the trial doesn't pan out is that you know when when the patient gets directed towards one route the interventional cardiologist sees him they stent almost everything and it's very rare now people are not even aware that there's this approach that we can still get the survival benefit from a lima graph um, and still do PCI, so they get the best of both. And I'll show you one of the cases next one. Sure. Right. No, I appreciate that. But then the other question I would have is, and and I'm not sure this is, this is certainly not routinely done, but uh, prior to doing the type of procedure that you just showed us, would you have uh, insisted that the cardiologist do uh, uh, an an injection of the IMA in particular, knowing before, you know, before you went to the OR that the, there wasn't any subclavian stenosis or some other, some other issue there. So generally for our cabbage patients, we'll take blood pressure on both arms and that's kind of a, a crude indicator, obviously. Um, you're right, and maybe that's why some of the patency rates aren't perfect. And, um, and I'll go over a couple of slides of data on that, but, um, initially, you know, the, the problem wasn't so much a subclavian stenosis when there was an early experience, experience with the mid-cab. It used to be done in the 90s, and 
but I think people weren't taking the lima graft all the way down to the where the subclavian artery, I'm sorry, the subclavian vein goes up when we do a sternotomy cabbage because you can see everything here. The exposure is a bit limited. Now you can add a camera and kind of help your exposure. And they made better doming devices, but sometimes the lima would get kinked when the lung would come up. Um, so there's a there was a learning curve from both the takedown of the vessel, how far, and I think that's kind of been sorted out. But um, so now now we use um, you know these minimally invasive devices that can kind of get a better exposure. So I think the patency is going to be a lot better in them. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so who is it not? I mean, there's still patients we don't use it for. Obviously, um, some of the absolute contraindications for this would be an emergency surgery or those with hemodynamic compromise. Now, you could say, like, well, we can put them on bypass, but they have to have adequate peripheral vessels in order to put them on cardiopulmonary bypass. Um, those with severe pectus deformities, um, again, like I said, the takedown is done under... Um, under uh, this dome-like retractor. So if they have a pectus, it's very difficult to actually see. Uh, those with severe pulmonary disease, because you are entering the left pleural space and just kind of rehabbing from that. Um, and so these taking, you know, the subclavian stenosis, just kind of crudely determining if they have pressure differential or even patients with left-sided AD fistulas. Now I will tell you in oncology patients who've had prior chest wall radiation, that's the only ones I would probably ask for. Um, a uh, either a CT angio up front or a direct injection of the subclavian artery. But I think for uh, a population without cancer and no chest wall radiation, I'm not really sure it's really indicated unless you have this pressure differential. Um, the relative contraindications, you know, redo surgery to the left chest. I've done it a couple of times. It's it's not fun. Uh, there's a lot more bleeding in that case, um, and a lot of adhesions to take down, which is not very easy to do from you know a couple of centimeter incision. Large-breasted women or morbidly obese patients, the retraction of the soft tissue is a little bit too challenging. Um, and those with severe LV dysfunction, like I said, if you have adequate peripheral vessels to do cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, support so that patient they don't tolerate retraction of, uh, to get to it, then I think that would be useful. Um, but it's something to think about for every case. Um, and so this was a pretty good study. Like I said, it's been done for a long time from the 90s to 2000. This was more of an early experience. This was an excellent center in uh, Germany of about 1,300 patients. Um, and they had a pretty good uh, you know, success rate of doing this operation. They only were unable to complete this in about less than 2% of patients. Um, they converted less than one, one and a half percent of the time and they only required, um, but they were pretty healthy patients. Like they only required carbon pulmonary bypass uh, in nine of their entire uh, patients. Um, and their post-operative mortality, if you use the STS risk score was about 3.6%, but compared to what their actual uh, post-op mortality was under 1%, so really good center. What they did was they performed angiography uh, on all patients and not just symptomatic ones. So elective angiography prior to discharge, if you note that there's already 3% grafts are occluded. Um, and so that could be from a variety of reasons. Now we don't obviously do elective uh, you know, angiographies on our cabbage patients, um, so perhaps the rate would be similar, it's hard to say. Those who got symptomatic angiogram, uh, sorry, angiograms for symptomatic patients had a 13% occlusion rate of their grafts. Now you're totally dependent on this one graft, and um, so it's a little bit, you know, tenuous if you don't have a good target. If it's if it's um, distal LED disease, then we probably wouldn't use this approach. Um, but the ones who got angiograms at the six month mark had about a 3% occlusion rate. So. We quote our data to be for sternotomy cabbage, the Lima to LED will last about 98% of the time for 20 years. Well, here it's a little bit less than that. Haven't figured out exactly why. And, and this is not even the, you know, the oncology patient population who might have some fibrosis uh, due to chest wall radiation. Um, here their uh, intervention, about 4% went on to get traditional cabbage, um, but they had a pretty good overall survival and a uh, freedom from reintervention rate of about 90% in seven years. So um, still a great, uh, great alternative. 
This was the uh, hybrid revascularization case. So this is a 77-year-old African-American veteran. Um, he had a prior history of left lung cancer with radiation to the chest about five years prior. I'm sorry, I don't have the doses of the radiation he received. Um, also had prostate cancer and um, had presented with severe multivessel disease. He had both calf, calf claudication as well as angina. Um, and he was a vasculopath, you know, he's hypertensive, hyperlipidemia. He had all the risk factors that he had for multivessel disease patient. But he particularly had an SFA occlusion, um, and this claudication was really bothering him in addition to the angina. So we have to think about, you know, is this guy going to down the road require lower extremity bypass? Because obviously, as you know, stents don't work really well for lower extremity um, revascularization. He was already on Plavix and a um, lot of medications. Um, and so um, just kind of going over, I just showed just a, one picture of his coronary anatomy. He had, in addition to this lesion in the LAD, so you can see there's proximal disease here um, into the distal left main, but also actually it was just proximal LAD and then a second lesion down, uh, down further here. Very tortuous, as you can see, kind of dips down and curves back up. His function was also pretty good, so we didn't have to worry about that as being one of the biggest risk factors. Um, so, sorry. Um, so the options here, he had a risk score of mortality risk score. Now this is a 30-day risk of mortality is about, was just over 3%. And that's pretty significant. Most coronary bypass cases that we do through a sternotomy that don't go to PCI are really between one and 2% is kind of the max ones we take. Then it gets, you know, much higher risk. Uh, but in this case, he had a higher risk PCI option because of the tortuosity and like a dip down and went back up. So he could get that. Or he could, and then he also had a right lesion that was a very discreet right lesion. And just for the data on bypass surgery, our vein by bypasses to the right side are pretty, um, are probably just as good as the PCI data. So really, if we have a, just a right side of disease, you know, that I think a patient can get a stent. I'm a little bit more aggressive towards leaning them that way. Um, so in this case, we decided to do hybrid revascularization for him. And um, he did pretty well. We did a mid-cab also for him. And four days later, he went back to the VA and he got his PCI to the right and um, went on to get his lower extremity revascularization. So in this approach, you know, for hybrid revascularization, essentially, um, where we do this lima to LED and then PCI, uh, I wasn't aware of the clinical trial that we had done here, but... Um, but really, some of the advantages here are you still get the survival benefit from the Lima graft, and you can put these better and better drug-eluting stents to the circumflex or, um, or to the right coronary artery. And then here, the, the great thing is that you can actually test or see what the, um, the Lima LED uh, bypass is done at the time of the uh, stent placement. So after surgery, do we have a 3% occlusion rate like we saw in that German, German study? Um, and it's good for patients who have, you know, limited uh, conduit, like in this case, we might have to use vein for his, he wasn't a radial artery candidate, he had bad corn, uh, sorry, diabetes. Um, his veins were probably needed to be for lower extremity bypasses. So you kind of have to think about what does this person need for the rest of their life and not just what do they need now. So before we used to just consider heart surgery as being the most important and then quality of life is, I think, most important, as you know, in the oncology population is how do we get them to live longer and have all of the options available to them. Um, and the concerns, you know, the potential concerns are there's two procedures, there are two sets of complications that are very different. Um, reimbursement issues, I think that's kind of going on the wayside now, and I think people are realizing that we have to do what's best for patients. Um, there's still no survival advantage uh, or subsequent um, uh, de sorry, decrease in subsequent MI compared to a standard cabbage. Um, and there is no long-term randomized clinical data as yet. But I think this is where more and more people are moving towards is hybrid uh, revascularization. Even in our open cases, we're doing that. So I think it's important. Um, so a heart team is the cornerstone for patient-centric based um, uh, case. It's a class one indication in the 2010 European Society of Cardiology. Um, and the Cardiothoracic Surgery Society. And, you know, there's so many clinical trials that are 
that have been ongoing, but I think the most important is that synthesizing all of this information can be very difficult for just one person. So I think getting that heart team approach is, um, is really good. So we're gonna switch gears here and head over to, uh, oh, sorry, one more um, thing on use of lemographs um, for patients who receive mediastinal radiation. So before this study looked at about 138 patients over 20 years at the Mayo Clinic that received between 30 and 60 gray of uh, radiation to the mediastinum. And here in this particular case, they only got, they only did angiographies in patients who had um, symptomatology. So majority of them really weren't done. Um, I think only 25 patients uh, got that uh, at the time at that time. So, and, and even in that population, they found that 32% of those graphs uh, had greater than 70% stenosis at two and a half years versus 60% for the non, non lima graphs. Um, so, on the left hand side in their first figure is the age adjusted survival comparing the patients who received uh, lima graphs compared to vein graphs, the LAD. Um, it didn't reach statistical significance, but um, you know, the survival was superior um, in the ITA graft. Um, for the survival of patients who had prior mediastinal radiation therapy, when compared to an age and gender matched uh, population, any patient with prior mediastinal radiation had a significantly reduced late survival. So don't do as great, but I think the point is you can still use a lima graft and it's still, as you have improvement in survival overall from the cancer, I think it's still important if it's visibly okay to still go ahead and use it. Yeah, I think that, you know, we've, we have talked about uh, in all of those patients that have had uh, mediastinal radiation in particular, you really should uh, in, inject the IMA prior to surgery. And I think that we've, we've recommended that uh, partly because of the data that you just showed. If you look at those patients that had mediastinal radiation, they ended up with an IMA stenosis in a short period of time after the bypass. So even if, even if uh, you know, it looked okay at the time of surgery, there probably was underlying atherosclerosis because of the prior radiation. So I think that uh, I, I'm not sure that cardiologists generally recognize that. So I think that uh, from, from our perspective, we need to uh, really consider the ramifications of mediastinal radiation uh, in terms of the total revascularization picture. So anyway, I mean. Interesting, like that, even that study, they, it was just visually, they said it looked fine. And so they only yeah. really did patients who had obvious fibrosis. But even then, I think, but in their case, they hadn't done routine angiography of just the lima. So I think that's important to kind of take. So I totally agree with that. Or even a CT angiogram, if you can see a patent vessel, if there's any question to then, you know, perform a selective angiography of that. Um, but it's kind of surprising that, you know, that the rates are so high um, despite that. And, you know, so I'm not sure that's the absolute best strategy, but I think it's still a good strategy because they it's still didn't have um, a worse survival. So I think for now, that's what we still continue to do. Great, um, thank you. I wanted to share a couple of cases in the valve world. So again, like I said, I won't be talking anything about the transcatheter realm, which is uh, a big part of where we see most of our uh, patients somehow involved in the, the cancer world. You know, if they have it, we try to gear them towards the least minimally invasive approach. But I think this was kind of an interesting case. This I participated uh, in when I was a fellow. Uh, so there was a 31-year-old Caucasian female. And, and Pooja, sorry, I didn't, I'm not trying to interrupt your, your flow there, but just one other comment on the previous case you had the STS score was greater than three percent, and yes. you uh, you mentioned that you know that's in that particular patient he had a lot of other risk factors. That's certainly true, but you know the interesting thing about the STS score, and this this applies not only to coronary bypass surgery but also to valve disease, which is obviously what you're about to talk about that the STS score underestimates the risk in a patient with cancer because it doesn't factor in uh, 
what their cancer was or what their treatments were. So even if they have radiation therapy in previous in their previous history, that's not it's not calculated in the STS score. And uh, you know, so I think that in any patient that's had mediastinal radiation, whatever the STS score recommend is recommending, you probably need to double it or even triple it, given that the uh, you know those those scores were developed without factoring in the cancer treatment history. Yeah, I completely agree. That's why the place we have that in the STS risk score is if they were immunocompromised. We kind of put every cancer patient into that category, whether that means they received prior you know radiation or chemotherapy or had some history of it, because there's really no other way. But I think the range was like generally our cabbage patients are between one and two percent. And so anyone exceeding that is, you know, whether cancer or no cancer is still a pretty significant risk. And so I think we really question, should we take a person to surgery when they have for at least cabbage? Now the valve world's different. The valve STS score, what's considered high risk, is over four percent. So the risk of mortality, I mean, here's a patient who's already sort of had two cancer. And then he has all these risk factors, and he really wants his leg done because, you know, chest pain bothers him so much because he can't even walk to get his. Sorry about the feedback there, Will. Uh, so yeah, so you know, it's I think the main focus here is quality of life, but um, I wanted to talk about this case only because I thought this was. A little bit. It was. It was certainly rare, and it's very interesting that um, and unfortunate. So this is the only sad case I'll present today. But so this is a 31-year-old Caucasian female. She originally presented um, with severe mitral regurgitation, and um, and they're not the echo images from the original one, but essentially in the operating room, she was underwent a minimally invasive mitral valve repair through a thoracotomy. And at that time, uh, what was demonstrated? What was um, uh, listed was that there were some small inflammatory nodules uh, present uh, sorry present on the posterior leaflet causing some restrictions so it's kind of not your standard um, flail leaflet due to cortal rupture things like that and so um, there was some restriction in the posterior leaflet these nodules were resected um, the leaflet was repaired with some Gore-Tex and then an annuloplasty band was placed. And so the pathology on that came back as fibrosis uh, and just chronic inflammation. So kind of strange for a 31 year old, otherwise healthy, no medical problem patient. Um, and then she presented a year later and, um, and she had recurrent severe regurgitation once again. And so at this time there were now the leaflets had sort of thickened. There was like more fiber, fibrous tissue in there. Um, and again, a repair was once again attempted, but when the cross nap was taken off, um, somehow the co-optation wasn't good anymore. And so at that time, uh, we just elected to do a cordial sparing valve replacement with a mechanical valve. Um, and the pathology on this came back at, as myxoid degeneration. So, okay, thought that, you know, perhaps that was the end of it. Um, uh, she presented uh, one year later again, uh, and she was short of breath, and now she had these large masses in the left atrium that were causing blockage of this mechanical mitral valve. Um, and here you can see that there's like this whole left atrium, and this is like kind of the valve, sorry, the views weren't that great to, to find this, but, really just kind of filling up the left atrium. And the first thing you assume is that, oh, she's, you know, the coumadin is probably not therapeutic and she's developed some clot and it's obstructing the mechanical mitral. And so she uh, was taken to the operating room. And really what we found was that the entire, this left atrial appendage and into the left atrium um, and kind of overlying and going next to the valve was this kind of thrombus-like, uh, mass or tumor, uh, which we took out as much as we can, cleaned it up, and we sent it off to the pathology uh, during the case and tried to cryoblate the base, thinking that perhaps there was like some myxomatous, uh, you know, cause for it. And then we ended up putting a biologic valve in it. And actually, the pathology came out to be low grade sarcoma in this 30 some year old um, female. And so, 
that was quite unfortunate because really, as you all know better than I, um, um, and this was a cardiac MRI picture taken right after the, actually the, the mass was resected and then she has some filling defect in the left atrium once again, like immediately after surgery, probably a week later. Um, so really not great therapy, but she did receive a couple of cycles uh, of chemotherapy. Um, however, she didn't tolerate it, ended up in the hospital with neutropenia fevers and pneumonia, ended up getting what they thought were lung metastases. They biopsied them or actually just pneumonia. She just was too exhausted to tolerate any chemotherapy and I think uh, was um, finally presented for radiation therapy, was offered some palliative therapy and declined um, and she eventually passed but she only you know that kind of rapidly progressed over a two-year period so um, that was an unfortunate case and kind of rare but you know we do uh, we do occasionally run into most of them are actually like usually myxomas and I've never seen a case of this um, and even during training and afterwards besides this case so that was um, kind of uh, worrisome and the final case is actually um, more along the lines of, you know, where we would normally send this patient to the Taver uh, world. 71-year-old Caucasian female has left breast cancer, underwent chemotherapy, radiation therapy. She also had a pretty bad radiation changes to the skin overlying the sternum and had severe um, symptomatic aortic stenosis. So she presented to our valve clinic, um, had dyspnea on exertion, and she had um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, she had lung disease, she had some parotid stenosis, she had this left, uh, left sided mastectomy um, and the radiation changes, and she had a right sided porticath. Um, and, you know, these are listed medications. And so during our usual workup, we ended up getting a left heart catheterization, really just showed some moderate coronary disease. All of these were IFR negative. Um, here are the left and right system, so nothing there to revascularize. On the echo, um, her gradient was about 40 millimeters across the valve. Um, it was not bicuspid, um, not much AI. Um, we kind of look at that as to figure out what best surgical approach. Um, so she's got her Taver CT scan and what you can see, and I'm sure you have heard the series on what sort of high-risk features we look for in Taver, but there was this large nodule that actually extended down <clears throat> into her left LVOT. Um, and so the reason that becomes important is, you know, once it exceeds about four millimeters, the risk of annular uh, disruption, um, you know, significantly increased as well as the risk of paravalvular insufficiency. So as you know, in the in the TAVR world, if you have at least more than mild paravalvular insufficiency, we really haven't helped the patient long term. Um, so we really wanted to try to see if there was a surgical way to, to approach this patient or if we had to just consider her for high-risk TAVR. Her other um, testing her, she had some COPD, um, but she had fairly decent preserved lung function. Her carotid disease was sort of stable and she was asymptomatic from it. So here, her STS risk for mortality was 3%. So actually on the low to intermediate risk, about 4% would be intermediate. I'm sorry, she was intermediate risk, 2 to 4%. Um, and so, you know, her options here are higher risk TAVR. So, you know, we we often have discussions in our multidisciplinary valve team about should we, um, you know, should we intervene uh, on patients with large nodular calcium at the annulus? What do we do if they <laughs> Um, and and or do we offer some sort of minimally invasive AVR? Majority of the patients, um, you know, are for even straightforward AVRs are offered some sort of mini sternotomy approach. Um, but at the time I was doing this, this was probably one of my first few cases. But I started um, looking at to trying to do a an AVR through a right anterior thoracotomy. Um, and so this was again one of my um, you know, out of training, you have to sort of do something different than your colleagues. And I was like, well, this I thought this would be an ideal patient for trying this. So we did offer her right anterior thoracotomy AVR. Uh, she did pretty well from it. She uh, went home seven days later. So similar to sternotomy one, the only reason she stayed longer was because she developed postoperative atrial fibrillation. So as you know, minimally invasive AVRs, um, there's many, many different ways people have described some sort of 
many J, T sort of sternotomies, but this right anterior thoracotomy is an actually interesting approach. Um, it can use, it's really safe for all age groups, even if they have, um, don't have good anatomy for TAVR. Um, you can perform isolated AVRs to so right anterior thoracotomy approach. And if you move the incision a little bit more laterally, you can get the mitral valve as well. And, it's, and you know, the tricuspid valve can also be done through a right thoracotomy approach. So any patients who kind of need, can't do a sternotomy or even have bony metastases to the sternum and things like that, we've sort of considered patients for um, uh, these right thoracotomy approaches. Um, I have to say in the AVR world, there has to be some favorable anatomy. I've done a few cases where the AOR does on the opposite side of the chest because of rotation or some sort of torsion of the heart um, and the mediastinum, and that makes it a lot more challenging, but still can be done. Um, uh, and it would be ideal for there's a certain distance between the aorta and the sternum that can make this surgery a lot more straightforward. Um, so it really is exact like this. Um, from this figure, you can see um, this is a right thoracotomy approach. The head's on the left side. Um, it's a, about a six centimeter similar incision. It's between the second or third inner space. Um, you do divide the rima uh, in this case, and really the patient is cannulated through the groin. So you have to be able to cannulate peripherally, so no significant calcifications, and they have to be a pretty good candidate for this. You can also use the axillary artery. Um, though most of the ones I've done are using femoral. Um, and then, you know, do you do a trans thoracic cross clamp? Um, so really put it through the chest um, or even through the same incision, you can get everything through there and perform your valve replacement that way. Um, so this actually is a lot easier than the minimally invasive cabbage, just FYI. Um, uh, the advantages here, are there's decreased morbidity. Um, blood transfusion, hospital stay, wound infection rates, and actually looks a lot better uh, for a lot of patients, and you don't have the sternal um, restrictions. So that's that's important for a lot of patients because after standard sternotomy, as you know, there's weight limitations of no more than a gallon of milk for about the first month, and we, you know, they all come back with popping and clicking of the sternum. Here you can even put a rib plate across it if you're worried about stabilization, especially in a cancer patient. Um, some of the disadvantages, it does take uh, double the amount of time than a standard AVR procedure. Just the setup is done on cardiopulmonary bypass because you have to kind of get exposure to the heart and the aorta. Um, and um, and it's not, it can't be used exactly for everybody. Like I said, there's some limitations. If you can't peripherally cannulate them, then that's not the patient for this approach. So those heavily calcified aortas are probably not the ones you want to do because a lot of patients with radiation therapy do have calcification, so we, we do worry about that. Um, so again, it's not for chest deformities. If you've had prior radiation to the right hemithorax, we probably would shy away from it because the adhesions might be a little bit too, too much to take down safely, because here you don't have port incisions that you're able to visualize other things through nothing. Uh, patients who need any emergency sort of surgeries, um, any large ascending aneurysms, um, unless they meet the size criteria under five and a half centimeters, it's probably not the best approach because the quality of the aorta might not be perfect to do this, but, um, but we have done it in larger aorta patients if needed. Um, severe peripheral vascular disease that would preclude peripheral cannulation, like I said before. Uh, this is a list of studies that's been around since about the early 2000s. Um, this is over the last 2004 to 2014. So a number of centers, not a lot of high volume, but as you know, with the with Tavern Place, our volumes for surgical AVRs are about in the 50 to 100 per year range. Um, so now the the ones uh, that some of the benefits, obviously. Length of stay is kind of most important. Sternal wound complication, things like that, are a lot less. Um, the disadvantage we talked about: longer, longer bypass and pump runs. Stroke risk is not, not any different from a standard surgical AVR. The conversion rates are fairly low. Um, it's five percent is quite high, but anywhere from one to three percent. And uh, the the uh, perioperative mortality is. Uh, non-significant between those two. So it's well tolerated and I think it's a great approach for using in patients. I actually offer it to a lot of 
patients um, who don't even have surgical changes, uh, I'm sorry, who don't have radiation changes to the chest, I think they, they like this approach a lot better. So to conclude, really, um, I think it's still important that there is still a role for cabbage over PCI and a role for surgical valve replacements over the transcatheter world, because everyone wants to go minimally invasive. Um, uh, so there's still a role for traditional surgery. I think for certain patients with a suitable anatomy, we can use both minimally invasive um, uh, techniques for both cabbage and valves, and they're safe and effective. And I think the biggest thing to take home, as you all know, is that I think the heart team approach is the most important. You manage patient expectations, but you also individualize the patient scenario um, for both coronary intervention and valve replacement, and really think about, uh, you know, quality of life over everything else. And with that... That's uh, really fantastic, and those are, those are excellent cases uh, illustrate the points, so thank you so much for that. The, uh, the other thing is, I, I was just curious, you know, you put on one of your one of your slides that, you know, you might not consider doing that type of surgery uh, when they have a porcelain aorta. But how do you come to that conclusion? I think when you when you're in the OR and you look at the aorta or you put your fingers on it, then it becomes very clear that it's porcelain. But what about uh, what about just reviewing CTs? Is there a certain amount of calcification that you, you say, oh, that's a little too much, uh, or, or, you know, how, how is there a qualitative assessment of whether there's a porcelain aorta or not? Well, I think with better, I've never gone, luckily, knock on wood, throughout my fellowship or as, a, as, in, as, um, as an attending, where I run into a porcelain aorta after opening up the patient. If there's any concern, every single patient with a prior history of any sort of cancer will get a CT scan. And anytime you do a minimally invasive procedure, we get CT angiograms because the most important thing is putting them in the heart-lung machine. So if they have calcium in their iliacs or they have you know, chronic dissections or any sort of vasculopathy in the abdominal aorta, I don't even offer a minimally invasive approach. Um, so, and those patients are the ones who typically have, um, you know, bad peripheral disease. But, um, so in this traditional sternotomy patient, if you're worried about aortic calcification, I would say circumferential aortic calcification. Um, for coronary disease, um, if you can do it off pump and you don't have, it's basically no touch technique of the aorta. So if you can, you know, I've taken, um, for calcified aortas and off pump off the innominate artery and bypass to the LAD using a vein. Um, and so there are approaches by not touching the aorta. Uh, for coronaries, obviously you can do it better than for a valve because on every valve case you have to cross clamp. Um, and if it's, you know, if it's circumferential, um, no matter how thick or thin, you're putting the stroke risk higher. So now with TAVR uh, or transcatheter mitral procedures, if you can offer them that, uh, with significant aortic calcifications, I would say that's the route to go. So definitely, uh, at least in your mind, the if they have some evidence of circumferential calcification, then that would that would be a, a basically a no go for a valve procedure. Yeah. 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 Pooja, I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Um, yes. That was a terrific talk. Thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed it. How often do you actually see subclavian stenosis in someone who's had mantle radiation? I had a case a while ago where they had, uh, after surgery, the patient had um, basically lemus steel, coronary steel, because it's smooth coronary uh, uh, stenosis at the uh, subclavian origin. And it really wasn't anticipated. And at that point, I felt everybody should be looking at it, should be looking at it often. You actually have a problem and also with the, with the rod, who also, which are also rated. Uh, does that become a special result? Sorry, I missed the, your question, the last part of your. Well, the question was how often do you actually see issues with the carotids and the subclavians and people who have been bleeding? And how often does this actually occur? I'm sorry, is anyone else having. <laughs> 
Yeah, no. Uh, let me, let, can you hear me? This is this is Kerry uh, Skirka. Um, yes. He's asking about how often do you see subclavian steel? And I'll just tell you, uh, you just made me so happy. I am an open heart nurse. I started two programs. I am a cancer survivor and I haven't had anybody to talk uh, open heart and everything you said just brought I mean, I know about the Lima, I know about the Rima, I know everything you just said, I know about ST, and you just excited me. And so he's talking about subclavian steel, I see it all the time. And so that's what his question is, how often do you see it? Well, luckily, not much, because every single patient who has any cancer history, we're getting scan on. So if you have a significant stenosis and you have blood pressure differential, I'd be surprised if that patient doesn't have a blood pressure differential, um, you know, with it or some sort of arm claudication if you really have symptoms. So everyone's going to get a, uh, a CT scan pre-op and, and like Dan was saying earlier, we we, um, we do get selective angiography in patients who are going to the Lima graft on. So, and I'm also very particular, though rarely reported, is left sided AV fistulas um, and doing a Lima graft in those. So, in those patients, I also tend to do um, uh, a free Lima graft if I need to rather than just coming off of their left arm because in dialysis, they end up having uh, uh, syndrome as well. So can I ask a follow-up question? Because when I started a program in a community center, I tried to push this and they wanted their own anesthesiologist. I finally said, how can you share how important it is to have a cardiovascular anesthesiologist when you're doing this? Because it was a huge challenge and we actually lost our first case. And I think I attribute it to um, a lot of things, but not having the right person there at the helm helping that physician was huge. Oh, I mean, I think um, so. We're spoiled, you know, at an academic center to have a cardiac anesthesiologist trained for every one of our uh, even off pump cases. And I think that's most important in off pump, you know, the minimally invasive coronary surgery. You need a person up top who's going to tell you, hey, uh, you know, you're doing a single vessel lima, it's a pretty big vessel, unless it's a Included, you know, like I said, um, but you know, doing a test occlusion, making sure the ACT level is appropriate, and that's the time during the bypass we had to clean the vessel prior to that. Um, if they don't tolerate the test occlusion, if they're getting hypotensive, try to get the blood pressures up during that during that time that you need to perform it. Sometimes you can't occlude the distal, you allow it to fill with collaterals and you have to work in a little bloody field, but only a person who's really well trained up top. And we use transesophageal echo for every single one of our cases. So um, we know, you know, that's gonna be from the cardiac anesthesiologist um, who's well trained in both the valve world and the coronary world. So I I I hundred percent agree with your point. I think we're spoiled if you have if you don't have it, I think you should have one person. And especially doing these higher risk cases and minimally invasive, and especially if you're starting like I was, I started out my fellowship after my fellowship, I hadn't done any minimally invasive coronaries or these right anterior VRs and had to start my own sort of program. And and so I needed somebody at the, you know, at the head of the bed who who knew exactly what they were doing. So I think um, that was very helpful. Well, I'm coming to Wasu just to see you. Um, I was coming to see Dan and Holly, but now I'm coming for you because I have a bicuspid aorta and I had anthracyclines and it was before anybody paid any attention. And if I ever need to get a TAVR, um, I'm coming to see you. Sounds perfect. Welcome. All right. Well, I don't know if there are any other questions out there. Uh, Looks like Stephanie Feldman had a question. All right. Hi, um, my name is Stephanie Feldman. I'm a cardio-oncology fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, thank you so much. This was an awesome talk, particularly as we don't have cardiothoracic surgery here at Memorial. Um, we use our colleagues at Cornell and Mount Sinai for the most part. Um, so this is really helpful. The question I had, and I've seen um, in our some of our patients who've had mantle cell radiation, I'm uh, sorry, mantle radiation is uh, post uh, sternotomy, some significant lymphatic drainage issues with like recurrent pleural effusions um, requiring pleurex and things like that. 
I don't know if you've seen this or if you've seen less of this with the minimally invasive procedures. Um, and in particular, I noticed that you mentioned some of the contraindications or um, reasons that you would consider not using the minimally invasive procedures if they've had like fibrosis on the side that you're planning on entering. So how do, have you seen this or how does that impact your decision, uh, minimally invasive versus open sternotomy? So actually the only lymphatic problems are really in the groin, especially because that's where a lot of them uh, they get um, lymphocytes, but we usually get our IR colleagues to kind of drain them and see uh, or do lymphangiography and kind of uh, ligate any of the, the obvious branches. I haven't seen it in the chest much. Um, only one patient who had a sternotomy for non-cancer, uh, no history of prior cancer did I ever have this uh, a lymphatic drainage is quite rare from uh, from that. But again, like you said, um, now the patients who are receiving more and more uh, radiation to the chest, and if they have any significant changes of their aorta, they're all getting more of the transcatheter realm. So like we're seeing more patients in our valve clinic with um, long-term, you know, oncologic history. So, um, but if they've had significant radiation to the right chest, they're probably not going to get a right anterior thoracotomy. That's the, it's unusual to have both, where you're going to have a history of cancer, a history of radiation, and then you have severe LVOT calcium. So, um, so it's probably unfortunate, but I think now with, with TAVR and other cells, um, you can probably avoid the economy complications. Great. Thank you so yeah. much. No, excellent question. Uh, yeah, so Pooja, thank you so much for uh, for your presentation. It's been really wonderful, and uh, we we just really appreciate all your thoughtful care of our patients. And you know, we look we look forward to you know other other challenging decisions and how we uh, best manage each individual patient. So thank you again. It was fantastic. Thank you so much. All right, thank you all. We'll see you next week. Take care. Great, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much.